the brain processes 400 billion bits of information a second, but we're only aware of 2,000 of those. That means that reality is happening in the brain all the time. You should try it. How do I know what I'm doing? I and the base are one. Your work too. I live through my eyes. I can't even react. Not just some nebulous, nothing, touchy, feely world of shifting whatevers. If it's real, I want to see it. The eyes are, uh, in some senses, a camcorder because they are taking that information and they're they're storing it. But, but they're not. You're not really able to get it to mean anything until you actually put it all together. So, in some senses, it requires the editor's table to really put the whole thing together, to put the movie together of what your your life and your world is actually about. If I get out of bed in the morning, okay, and I suddenly decide um, to take very seriously the claim, which is surely a true claim that I don't know for sure if my eyes are working correctly, okay? Um, so that for all I know, even though it looks like there's a stable floor by the side of my bed, there might be a cliff or something like that, okay? Um, if I am unable to order those possibilities in terms of probabilities that I assign to them, then I'm not going to get out of bed. It seems to me I'm paralyzed in the most literal sense of the word, okay? I'm not... Um, um, I'm going to have no idea how to literally take the next step. It's definitely the case that we know that my eyes might in principle be deceiving me at any moment. We've had experience of people before subject to hallucinations and even if we didn't, we don't know how to prove as a fundamental matter that our eyes never deceive us. That's absolutely right. But when we make the decision to get out of bed in the morning, we are assigning probabilities to the various hypotheses compatible with my seeing a floor by the bed. One hypothesis is there really is a floor there, and that's why I'm seeing it. Another hypothesis is my seeing the floor is a hallucination, and there's a cliff there. By getting out of bed in the morning, you endorse one of those hypotheses as more likely than another. Well, ultimate reality, I think it very frequently depends a lot on how a person perceives it and, uh, and what they actually think is, is the real reality of our world. If the brain is processing 400 billion bits of information and our awareness is only on 2,000, that means reality is happening in the brain all the time. It's receiving that information, and yet we haven't integrated it. But if we're given knowledge and information outside of convention, outside the box of convention, or say we merge quantum physics and neurophysiology, and the brain is asked to contemplate, or we're, we're asked to contemplate on that, and examine the what-ifs and possibilities and potentials, and associate our knowns with our experience of what we know, and repeat it over and over again, the brain is going to start to integrate two independent neural nets, and it's going to create a new vision. And that new vision is going to be by taking a flashlight and shining it from those 2,000 bits of information that have to do with our body and our environment and time slightly over in the dark and looking at something new. That's called realization. You okay? I heard you scream earlier. Was it another dream? You were an Indian. Watching Columbus's ship materialize out of thin air. Wow. And this medicine man kept hitting you. Cool. This, hey, maybe it was a past life or a parallel reality or a future life. Good for you. Or maybe that dream was trying to tell you the truth. I guess it just depends on what you think is real. Maybe you should try different anxiety pills. My pills are fine, okay? Big too. Well, I have to go get dressed. Mm. I hope you feel
feel better, Amanda. God, Amanda. I could put such an asshole. People ask me, why does quantum mechanics matter, given that it's all just little tiny stuff and who cares? There are three possible answers. From a practical point of view, it doesn't make any difference at all. I mean, you still have to go to work and drive your car and do all the, and the rest of it. From a second point of view, it actually it, it infiltrates everything in the world, especially the world of electronics. When you go to the supermarket and you do the scanning at, at the checkout, that's a quantum mechanical effect. But I think the important part is the third one, which is essentially a philosophical issue. Why are philosophers so passionate about deconstructing the, the assumptions of the world? I finally got it. I got it as a result of looking at quantum mechanics and comparing it to classical mechanics. They're, they present two very different ways of thinking about the way that the world works and about what we are. So from a classical perspective, we are machines. And in machines, there's no room for a conscious experience, it doesn't matter if a machine dies, you can kill a machine, you can throw it in a dump, it doesn't matter. If that is the way that the world is, then people will behave in that way. But there's another way of thinking about the world which is suggested, it's pointed to by quantum mechanics, which suggested that the world is not this clockwork thing, but it's more like an organism. It's a highly interconnected organismic thing of some type, which extends through space and time. In that kind of environment, what I think and the way that I behave has a much greater impact, not only on myself, but on the rest of the world, than it would if it was a classical world. So from a, a, a very basic point of view having to do with, with morals and ethics, what I think affects the world. That's, I mean, in a sense, that's really the key for why a worldview change is important. Let's talk about the subatomic world. And then we'll talk about what it's telling us about reality. The first thing I want to tell you about the subatomic world is it's totally a fantasy created by mad physicists trying to figure out what the heck is going on when they do these little experiments. By little experiments, I mean big energy in little spaces and little pieces of time. It gets pretty nutty at that realm of things. And so subatomic physics was invented to try to figure that all out. We need a new science down there. It's called quantum physics, and it is subject to a whole range of debatable hypotheses, thoughts, feelings, intuitions as to what the heck is really going on. So on the one hand, you had a theory from which from the conceptual standpoint was profoundly puzzling, and on the other hand, from the practical standpoint, was vastly more successful than anything we had ever seen before. This is the kind of situation that produces the tension that all of the investigations of foundations of quantum mechanics are feeding off of since then. Because on the other on the one hand, this is a this is an acutely paradoxical, puzzling, um, conceptually confusing theory. On the other hand, we have no option along the lines of throwing it out or neglecting it because it is the most powerful proven tool for predicting the behaviors of physical systems that we have ever had in our hands. The universe is very strange. There seem to be two sets of laws that govern the universe. In our everyday classical world, meaning at roughly our size and time scales, Things are described by Newton's laws of motion, set down hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And they work very well for billiard balls and cannonballs and gravity. However, when we get down to a small scale, when we get down to, say, the level of atoms, a different set of, of laws take over. These are the quantum laws, quantum theory, quantum mechanics. And at that level, particles may be in multiple places at the same time. They may behave as waves smeared out spatially and temporally. They may be interconnected over great distances. They may um, be unified into one quantum state, into one state governed by one wave function. And the borderline, the threshold, the, this curtain between the quantum world and the classical world is really mysterious. It's called sometimes the collapse of the wave function because in the quantum world, everything is in superposition of multiple possibilities and in the classical world these multiple possibilities seem to collapse to particular definite choices so everything is in one particular place. 